Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Simon Mills. I'm a senior associate at the Zen Group, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's lecture in Knowledge Miles, webinar series associated with the 695th Lord Mayor of London, the Right Honourable Professor Michael Manelli. Now, the theme for this lecture series is connections in and around the square mile, what the Lord Mayor calls the world's coffee house, and how these connections can help us tackle the challenges facing society. The lectures are delivered in association with the Jewel in the City's Crown, the livery companies. And today's webinar is provocatively entitled, Why Has Nobody Ever Told Me This? Initiating Sustainability and Success in SMEs. And I'm joined by Dr. Glyn Cartwright, the, worship, the master of the Worshipful Company of Marketers. Dr. Cartwright first trained as a teacher and later entered the corporate world by sales, rising to become the CEO of various brand leading companies, giving a lie to the old adage of those who can teach, as if they, sorry, giving lie to the old adage of those who can teach as if they weren't teaching, they would put the rest of us out of a job. Now, as always, the agenda of this webinar is very simple. Following my introduction, Dr. Cartwright will make his presentation and we'll move on to the Q&A discussion. Now, I'm afraid that you are all muted, but you are able to submit your questions using the chat tool, which is at the top of your screen. Please do chip in at any point of the proceedings. I'm going to be collating your questions and I will put them to our speaker at the end. As with all of our webinars, we're going to be recording this session and you'll be able to access the slides and presentation at a later date. And so, without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Cartwright. How do you initiate sustainability and success in SMEs? Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, as was said, I was master of the Worshipful Company of Marketors until last Thursday when I handed over to my successor. Uh, and the title of my lecture today is called Why Has Nobody Ever Told Me This? And what it's about is what business schools and universities should consider to change in order to make their programmes they offer more relevant to stimulate action within SMEs and entrepreneurs. Next slide, please. Uh, next. Before I do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background uh, to put the lecture into some sort of context. When I left school, I trained as a teacher, but I never went into teaching. I came into the construction industry and I worked with five of the major brands uh, within that sector, manufacturing building materials. I held position of sales director, marketing director, managing director, chief exec of various brands within that sector. Uh, and then 15 years ago, 14, 15 years ago, I left corporate life and I bought my own small group of companies within that sector, an industry I knew inside out. And in the first two years, I managed to lose a fortune, not only a lot of my own money and a lot of my business partners, but I lost over one and a half million pounds of venture capital money. Quite an, uh, an achievement in an industry you knew inside out. When I closed the businesses, the venture capitalist asked me to go and see them in Birmingham, which wasn't something I particularly wanted to do. But when I went down there, I sat in this big office and they said to me, Glyn, you've gone bust. I said, yes, I am aware of that. They said, well, you're going to come back and we want to let you know we'll invest in you again. I said, why? I've just lost over one and a half million of your money. Why would you invest in me again? They said, we stopped you doing something a year ago that we shouldn't have stopped you doing. So they put me into two of their other businesses that they paid me a lot of money for to help turn those around. And I came out of that meeting with my confidence boosted a, a bit, but I reflected on it. And I thought, I left corporate life to work for myself. But the minute I brought venture capital in, even though they only had 20% of the business, I was working for them and not myself. So I regathered that and I never put myself in that position again. And my son and I now own six businesses that have been trading successfully for over 12 years. And we operate in about 30 countries around the world. Next slide, please. Now, a bit about my academic background. 
uh, as I said, I trained as a teacher. When I came into the construction industry, uh, I did a diploma with the Chartered Institute of Marketing and I was awarded a fellowship with them when they first awarded their fellowship and I'm still a chartered fellow. Uh, I then uh, did an MBA in the, in the early 90s with the Open University. I wasn't over impressed with some of the tutors on that program. So at the end of it, I went back and I lectured for the Open University for over 35 years. I only did summer schools, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday morning. And that's where the title of this lecture came from. Because at the end of the first Friday session, which was about nine o'clock at Friday night, the delegates who were on that, who were all mature students, uh, say 35 up to 60, the most common thing they said to me was, why have we never been told this before? They had been told it, but it hadn't been made relevant to them at that moment in time. Uh, since then, I've lectured at the University of Sheffield and supervised MBA and MC MSc students, given guests lectures at Isade uh, in Spain and Alba in Greece. And I've written two Erasmus projects, a UK CES project and several regionally funded projects uh, about the development of SMEs. And then just over a year ago, I completed a six year doctoral study about what SMEs were looking for. So that's a little bit about my background. Next. Next. So my research. The first Erasmus project we did got cited by Erasmus independently as a program of excellence in terms of the impact it had on the delegates that attended it across all four countries. And I wanted to understand what it was about the programs that we were doing that were having the impact that the programs that were offered by business schools and universities didn't appear to be achieving. And so uh, at 62, I set about embarking on a research uh, and I chose one of the Erasmus projects to use as the base for my research uh, and I interviewed over 20 delegates who'd been on that program but I interviewed them at least two years post completion so they weren't still full of the euphoria of having been on a program they'd had two years to think about it and change I asked them quite a few questions but the key one was have you done anything different in your business as a direct result of attending this program that you wouldn't have done had you not attended it? They all said they had. So uh, I'll give you some examples about what was said. Next. The research looked at the four components in a business program, the content, what's in the program, the context, the way it's delivered, the facilitator who's delivering it, and the network, the people on the program. And I wanted to understand which of these components had greatest impact on stimulating action. I'll give you some examples of the feedback I had from the research. Next. The programs were different in so much as they were very much focused on about teaching the people on the program how to think, not what to think. They weren't trying to bring structure to a chaotic world of business. They were looking at it in a structured way and enabling people how to think, not what to think. Business leaders, when they come on one of these programs, they want to be involved. And what we want to do is to empower them to make decisions with their heart, with their knowledge of the industry, with their expertise, with their hard work. But they'll make that decision having considered more things, therefore improving their chances of success. Next. So I'll give you some examples. Like I said, I interviewed over 20 people who'd been on the program and all of them said they'd taken action that they wouldn't have taken. I'll give you four examples. The first one was a lady who had four physiotherapy practices in South Yorkshire. And when I asked her this question, she said, yes, this program made me realize it wasn't all about money. Uh, I'd been a member of the South Yorkshire Entrepreneurs Club for the last four years. And all anybody ever talked about was how many helicopters they got in their back garden. She said, but the program made me realize 
it wasn't about money. I wanted to spend more time with my daughter and there was nothing wrong with wanting quality of life out of your business. She said, so I totally rewrote my business plan to facilitate that. I said to her, what's happened to your business since she's done that? She said, it's gone like that. She said, I've got my passion back. I'm loving what I'm doing. I'm turning away work I don't want. She said, it's really made a difference. Another uh, guy I interviewed was the managing director of a remote IT support company, employed about 28 people. He just completed an MBA. And in fact, two years ago, he was voted South Yorkshire Business Person of the Year. And I asked him the same question. And he said, I made lots of changes. He said, but I'll give you an example. I took my two senior managers away for a day after the program and we explored what made us different. Why did people come to us as opposed to our competitors? He then turned his computer screen round, and the three things that made them different were his screensaver. Not only his screensaver, they were the screensaver on everybody in his business. The biggest company we had on that first program was a recycled food company who'd gone from a standing start to 20 million in three years, quite an achievement. I asked the MD the same question and he said, we made several changes. He said, but the biggest one we did is I took my board away for two days and we really looked at our business to understand what business we were in. He said, at the end of the two days, we realized we weren't in the business we thought we were in. And the business plan we had was for the business we were when we started, not the business we were today. So we totally rewrote our business. When I interviewed him two years after, the business had then grown to 40 million. The final example I'll give you was somebody that didn't have a business at the time. They were just about to set up a dance studio in, in Sheffield. And when I asked her if she changed her plan as a result of changes, she said, I did. She said, I realized that my greatest differential was quality. The quality of what I was offering was my differential. So I surveyed all the other dance studios in the area and I deliberately priced my classes 50% higher than them. Because if my differential was quality, my price had to reflect that. Those are just a few examples of uh, the feedback I got from there. So when you go into a, a doctorate, next, one thing you shouldn't do is go in with preconceived ideas. That's what everybody tells you. But when you're passionate about something, it's very hard not to go in with preconceived ideas. And I had my own ideas about what would be the greatest component to stimulate action. The findings I made were not quite in the order that I anticipated. What I found was the least important in terms of stimulating action was what I expected to, it was the content. It was what was in the program that had least impact on stimulating action. However, it was much more important in the minds of the delegates than I anticipated. The reason for that is all of the topics we were discussing were based on solid academic models. And it wasn't some bloke at the front saying how wonderful he was. So the fact the content was rigorous was very important. The context was the next uh, most important stimulating action. The way it wasn't was delivered. It was not done in a didactic way. We spent no more than 15 minutes on each plenary before breaking them into groups for them to relate the concept to their business at that moment in time. The one that I thought would be the greatest impact was the facilitator, uh, but it was actually second in, in stimulating action. All of the facilitators on these programs were practitioners. They were practitioners with good academic knowledge, but they were practitioners. And that meant they could tell stories, stories about the models that were being presented, how they had used them, or more importantly, when they hadn't, and how much that had cost them. Uh, and it, they could not only do that, they could facilitate the network of delegates to tell each other stories about, oh, I did this, I should have done that. The greatest component in stimulating action was the interaction between the network, them saying to each other, why don't you do this? I did that, why don't you try this? And people went away listening to that. And when I interviewed two years post completion, they were still meeting in subgroups regularly to facilitate this interaction. Next. But before you start, what I want from this program 
is to recognise the value of this discussion. I would love for business schools when they write programmes to have more interaction and recognise the power of that. However, before you start any business programme, next, you must understand the starting point. You've got to understand where that business is at that moment in time. And it has to be individual. Can you imagine if I drop you in the wilderness and I gave you a map and a compass and I said, right, I want you to get to point Y. Could you get there? Not unless you knew where you were at that moment in time. And it's exactly the same with a business. Before you embark on a development programme, the participants have to clearly understand where they are at that moment in time. And we asked them two questions. The first one was, we asked them to, next, we asked them to define the span and scope of their business. We didn't use those words. Those are academic words. We said to them, imagine you're sat in a pub and somebody comes up and sits at the side of you and says, tell me about your business. Describe your business to them in one sentence, maximum of two, using words that are simple and clear to understand. The delegates find that very difficult to do, but it's very important because that becomes your basis for all your marketing and your communication. The next question we asked them next was, what do you want from your business? Why are you in business? By this, we said, do you want to build it quickly to sell? Do you want lifestyle out of it? Do you want to build it and pass it on to your family? Why is that important? That's important because depending on your answer, you'll make different decisions when you come to certain crossroads. For instance, in our businesses, our key business, uh, we're the rapidly growing business in supplying waterproofing materials into roofing. But my son and I are from big corporate backgrounds. We're in it for lifestyle. The biggest distributor in that sector keeps knocking at our door and asking us to be a major supplier to them. We say no, because we know that if we do supply them in a couple of years time, they'll be such a big player for us that we'll be working for them and not ourselves. If we were building it to sell it, we would welcome that because we'd work for two years very hard add value to the business and then be out of it. So it's very important that people understand why they're in the business and what they want from it. Next, the other big ingredient for SMEs is cash. We all know that more businesses go out of business because of lack of cash than lack of profit. But cash isn't always the answer. I attended a seminar at the Old Bailey last year uh, where there were 12 of us looking at what SMEs in the City of London needed in order to develop more sustainable businesses. And until it got to me, everybody said they needed easier access to cash. My answer was not necessarily. I said, I think that rapidly growing businesses, yes, they need access to cash because one of the problems with growth is funding that growth. But you know, the majority of the businesses in the City of London are micro businesses. They're one or two man bands. And actually giving easy access to cash for them may not be a good thing. It may put them under pressure to pay back the debt, which means they wait worse short term decisions uh, in order to pay back the money at the expense of a better long term decision. So while cash is important, it isn't the be all and end all. Next, I've just completed my second Erasmus project, uh, which we did in the UK, Holland, Austria and Cyprus. And again, it's been a, a cited by Erasmus as a program of excellence in terms of impact. Next, this was to help disadvantaged entrepreneurs. So that was the, the bid that we won. Next, disadvantaged. Again, a problem with academia is the use of words. What do words mean? Disadvantaged. Uh, when we won the project, we went back to Erasmus and said, we've got to change the title. None of the delegates we're, we're approaching to attend the programme consider themselves disadvantaged. So we changed it to inclusive business programme. We then said, I then said to them, who do you consider disadvantaged? So we're clear about who we should be targeting. They said immigrants. Yeah. We said ethnic minorities. Yeah. They said disabled people. Yeah. People over 65. Yeah. Single parents. Yeah. They said women. I said, do you consider all women to be disadvantaged entrepreneurs? And they said, yes. I asked that question three times. 
So what that meant was the only people we couldn't invite on the program were middle class white males. But that's some story for another debate. Uh, some of the feedback, next please, some of the feedback we've had from this program was this, the whole project had a value to my business. My business has great potential and this course is the catalyst for me achieving my goals. I've got my focus back, feeling positive. Any program targeted at helping SMEs should have the objective of inspiring confidence. Inspiring confidence for them to make those interventions, but having considered more things. And you've got to, got to provide them with a toolbox, not of solutions, but of things they should consider before making their decisions. Next. What I would like the output of, um, of, of my programme, I would love for business schools to look at this and adapt what they do with, as a result of these findings. However, what surprised me from my research is a lot of the observations I were making have been made by other academic papers for over 40 years, but very little appears to have changed in business schools and universities. They're like a tanker very very slow to change uh, and so there's all sorts of th issues around that uh, some business schools are starting to adapt now i'm starting to see some but it's very very slow so if they don't do that what is the other option next perhaps for a new business school to open a business school that doesn't offer a certificates or qualifications but the delegates leave that with a better chance of success. Next, Erasmus, in my opinion, is the best research organisation educationally in Europe. Phenomenal work they do. But like every great organisation, they have certain lesser strengths. And one of the lesser strengths of Erasmus is they find all this great information, but then they keep it a secret. So they don't share it or they don't scale it. Next. So at the moment, it's down to the four companies that were involved in this, uh, this research to scale it. That's two universities and two consultancies. We're doing it ourselves uh, next. And we, we uh, are having a, we're running a program in London uh, on the 7th and 8th of March, but we can only have 20 people on that program. In order to have the impact we want, any more and we won't have the impact so all this great research and everything that's been done is not being scaled. So now I've stepped down as master of the virtual company of marketers. My objective for the forthcoming year is to help find a way of scaling the learning from this research. Thank you all for listening to me. And I'm now opening it up to questions from the group. Right, there we are. I've just put my microphone back on. Thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating, Glyn. And I can see we've got uh, a lot of questions from our audience. But as chairman, the privilege of asking the first one falls to me. Um, why is it, do you think, that business schools and universities are, are not changing what they teach, despite overwhelming evidence uh, that's been collated over the, the last 40 years? I think it's a very complex question and I think it needs to be driven by the government and the universities and the business schools. They have to make a profit uh, and so they need a real desire for the output of what they're offering to improve the chances of success for the SMEs but they have to make money out of doing that and I know that a lot of business schools were starting to struggle financially uh, and the development of the apprenticeship scheme has helped a lot of them. Uh, financially and I think the apprenticeship scheme is a great thing and I'd like to see something similar with the SME market if, if there's a sincere desire to help SMEs develop a more sustainable uh, business. Do you think the problem is that running a business is not an academic exercise so perhaps it shouldn't be taught in a university um, how else do you think you could actually deliver um, th th this kind of business program for SMEs, mentoring I, I think that, something similar. I think that's a great. I think that's a great question, and I think the terminology used by academia turns people off. 
you know, a lot of people, like I said, the, the delegates we had varied from people who've done MBAs and MS MSCs to loads of people who left school at 15. But by using language, which is in the workplace and not using academic terminology made a big difference. But more importantly, immediately relating that to their current needs had the difference. I'm, it's my opinion, but I don't think the move from polytechnics to universities was a good thing, you know, because, you know, uh, you know to have more universities doing the same things. There, this is why I say there may be a need for a new business school to appear that has that objective of helping SMEs. But that's got to be funded. It's got to be, you know, you, nobody's going to do it as a charity. I absolutely agree with you. And, and you know, polytechnics were set up on the German Technik Schule system and i think that there is a lot of uh, you know academic snobbery around universities and and I, I think we lost something uh when we when we changed the, the polytechnics into into universities i think it's a a real shame now something struck me that you were saying uh earlier on um with regards to how important it is uh for businesses to actually understand what business they're in um there's an apocryphal story uh, i'm sure you've heard about tim waterstone saying that he wasn't in the business of, of selling books he was in the business of selling a lifestyle and that is why waterstone's bookshops are designed the way they are the floor layout how can businesses actually drill down to focus on um the business they're in i think that's again a great question when we asked this question to the delegates, very few of them could describe their business. So we had to put them in groups where they challenged each other to describe their business. And then they go away and they reflect on it and they revisit it. And I think you need an outsider to say, well, tell me about your business and ask them if they understand what you're saying, because often they won't they jump in very quickly to describing what they do rather than say what is their business about and it's not easy for them to do it but it's essential that they do it absolutely oh now this is an interesting question um what's your view of employee share ownership programs can they actually help smes to uh to succeed if the, if the employees have got a stake in the business i believe that to make general observations is of every every business is independent and for some businesses that may be a viable option and again this is something we cover on the programs we look at the alternatives when they look at their what they have their resource and capabilities they then say are you well geared up to achieve your objectives and if not what are your alternatives for ensuring that you are so it can be uh, and so but it's dependent on every individual business and also what they want out of their business you know it gets back does this give me my objectives as well as the business needs so yes it can be but it's one of several options oh now this is an interesting question do you think the government should do more to help smes flourish are there any examples of, of low hanging fruit in terms of policy that you could you could think of? I would love for the government. They say all the right things, you know, like they do in a lot of things. You know, and they understand that the SME is the backbone of the UK economy. But I've seen very little. They put lots of money into it. And this is where money isn't the answer. The money is effective programs that people engage with. We judge the success of our programs by the retention. We have over 95% retention over a program. Whereas if they don't see what's in it for them from the first time they get there, they won't come back. They need to see, I'm going to have a better chance of success because of being here. And again, one of the things that when I interview people, they said, before I came on the program, I wondered whether I could afford time to come on the program. Since I've been on it, I realize I can't afford not to allocate time to step back from my business and look at it from the outside in. 
I'm a great believer in evidence based policy. And I think that, you know, when the government is putting money into programs, they need to make sure there is monitoring in there from the start to see how effective interventions are. And I think that, you know, audience feedback or looking at business success rate over a, a two year period for for SMEs have attended this sort of program would be one way of doing it. So I, yeah, I, I completely agree with you there. Now, did the businesses you interviewed in your research have similar views to yours of of, of, of venture capital involvement? Were, were any positive about uh, venture capital? No, no, well, to answer your question, uh, every business was again individual for some business venture capital would be the right thing uh, but you need to go in with your eyes open you know you need to go you need to make sure that their exit strategy meets your exit strategy and you need to make sure that you need that finance uh, so venture capital is phenomenal but for the right business at the right time uh, and this is about everything relating the options to their own business at that moment in time, but discussing it with fellow delegates to say, well, I'm thinking of doing this. Well, have you considered that? So I do, I'm a fan of venture capital. I think it's a great thing, but at the moment it's not for me. You know, it wasn't what I wanted at that moment in time, but I think venture capital is a phenomenal thing for the right businesses at the right time. Now, you run uh, this program internationally. What differences do you see in responses to your courses from from overseas? Uh, you know, when we start doing them, in like, when we start doing them in Cyprus or in Austria or in Holland or in Spain, when I sit down with my colleagues, they all say, well, our country's different. You know, our, they're not. The problems SMEs have are the same the world over. Uh, some of the language needs to be changed and some of the bureaucracy that they, they have to comply with uh, needs to be altered. But the basic principles and the challenges that SME leaders need is the same. And the feedback we had from the delegates in all countries was virtually identical, that it gave them confidence. And that's why I say you have to decide the objective. The objective is to empower the SMEs to say, hey, I I'm, I'm know what I'm doing and I'm now confident to make this decision because I've considered more things. It doesn't mean to say they're right, but it means to say they're empowered to make those interventions. Oh, now this is a really loaded question here. How can you um, create the same impact um, online as in person um networks are absolutely essential but are they effective when you're just seeing people on a screen how can you ensure that there is that that chemistry binding a network together if everybody's remote to answer that question we've been delivering a program for doncaster council for over eight years a, a growth accelerator program uh, and we've been doing that online for the last three and a half years. And the answer is we can still have impact, but you don't have the same impact. You absolutely do not have the same impact. You don't feel the passion. You don't sense the emotion. Uh, so whilst you can have an impact and we are still getting very, very positive feedback, it isn't as powerful as face to face but it can be done and it can have an impact. And like I said, we're getting really good feedback from the work we're doing with Doncaster Council. Yeah, I mean, there's, um, you know, that, 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 that's absolutely true. And I wonder, you know, uh, how the, the future of the city is going to, to evolve with so many people working from home, because you really need, especially young people, need to be in businesses to, to actually learn um, and develop networks and create relationships and actually understand corporate culture. And you can't do that if you're sitting in your bedroom. You need to be there. You need to be physically uh, physically engaged. But, you know, perhaps I'm an old man and uh, <laughs> times have moved on. Now, uh, now this is an interesting question. Um, can financial institutions do anything that they're not currently doing? Uh, in order to support 
um, the success of SMEs. So what can financial institutions do? What I find is I think financial institutions really do want to help, you know, and I think uh, they're looking for a way in which they can engage uh, and help. Uh, and I think big corporations, big consultancy practice, loads of people want to do it. In academia, 50% of the academics I came across recognised the need to change. 50% 50, 50 thought it was all about the accuracy of the knowledge. You know, when I did the o Open University MBA, when I was teaching that, we had 120 business models on that, on that, you know, on that uh, year's project. 120 business pro models. It was much better if the delegates understood 12 of them and really understood them than if they learned 120 that they could repeat. And I think people need to get together. The community needs to get together, put the government, businesses, financial services, and say, are we serious about helping SMEs? And if so, and I think particularly micro SMEs, you know, you want to develop the rapidly growing ones, but to be fair, they get a lot of support. It's the vast majority, as my passion is about helping the smaller SMEs. And I think everybody coming together to do that is a way forward. Have you had any contact with the Productivity Institute? Because it, it looks as though you know, a lot of what you're saying is very relevant to the work that they're doing. I haven't. And one of the aims of this lecture is to invite people, because I would like to look at how this can be scaled. My passion, I earn my money from construction. My passion is enabling SMEs. And, and that I would like to be more successful at that. Uh, so any feedback or uh, response we get from this, I would welcome, and I'll take on board that suggestion. Hmm. Now, we've had a couple of questions uh, around the word sustainability, and they are themed around the two meanings. So you've got financial sustainability, but you've also got sustainability in terms of uh, ensuring that you uh, conserve your resources in an ecological manner, ensuring that you are um, a responsible employer and a responsible part of a community. How do you actually address these issues within your course? Right, okay. First of all, words are terrible because they mean different things to different people. When I use sustainability in this context, means that the business will continue trading for a considerable amount of time. Sustainability in the context that you've just asked the question, at the moment for a lot of businesses becomes a differential. Shortly, it's gonna become an essential. It's gonna become a must have. But certainly at the moment, it's a differential. And if somebody could buy from company X or company Y, and they think they're both the same, but this one is more socially responsible and more sustainable, particularly with the younger market, they will go for that option. Uh, but it's about price, it's about cost, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, when we talk about brands, I give um, Amazon as an example. If you could buy a book online from Amazon for a pound or from somebody you'd never heard of for 99p, you'd probably buy it from Amazon. But if it was 50p from somebody else, you'd probably risk it. And I think it's the same with sustainability. The business has got to look and say, first of all, does this add value to my business? I've got to go that way, but at the moment, does it add value? And will it help me win more business? Because businesses need to make a profit. They should all be encouraged to be sustainable and they're gonna to have to be. And the sooner they start, the better. But how quickly they do that is dependent on what their return is gonna be on that. And I know ideologically we said that shouldn't be the case, but realistically it is. Mm, I think I might disagree with you on this point, Glenn, because I do think uh, if you take away the the freighting around the world, uh, I think sustainability in, in an ecological sense and sustainability in terms of the longevity and financial performance of a company are two sides of the same coin. I was working for a client um, about 18 months ago uh, and uh, one of the first things I, I, I did for them is say, well, okay, 
who pays your energy bills? Who's responsible for managing energy within your, your organization? And their answer was, well, the bills come in and the accountant pays them. And I said, right, okay, we're gonna do a bit of work here. I sat down, I worked out what their annual energy costs were. Uh, I worked out what electricity tariffs they were on and some of them were completely wrong. They were paying bills on buildings that actually disposed of, etc. And then I said to them, you do realize your energy bills are gonna increase by 75% over the next six months because it was just before uh, the, the, the problems with, with, with energy. So unless you are taking, um, uh, unless you're paying attention to your your um, your resource costs and your waste disposal costs, it can bite you in the bum. So I would say for an SME, don't think that it's an added extra. Keep an eye on it because it is core business. I totally agree with that. And uh, in our livery company, this has become a hot topic for us about the sustainability. But it's about the SME prioritising what they're going to do. Uh, to be there tomorrow. Uh, and this will become a must have in the not too distant future. Absolutely. Uh, right. Oh, my goodness. There's some very complicated questions here. Uh, right. Um, this one is about diversity. Did you measure the diversity of the backgrounds of the, of, of the people who are in the network? And was diversity important? Well, you're going to get my opinion on diversity here. Uh, I mean, I am a great fan of total inclusiveness. If you invite everybody and give everybody an equal opportunity, I believe the output is diversity. So uh, we, we had to be diverse in so much as we couldn't invite middle class white, white men on, on, on the programme. Uh, but the people who attended the programme were diverse from both ethnically, uh, both trades. I mean, like I said, some of them had left school at 14, 15. Some of them had been to college. Some of them were in uh, what you'd call the service industry. Some were in manufacturing, some were in trades. So we had a diverse group of candidates, but that wasn't by deliberately targeting specific groups. We put the programs out to everyone and the output of it was a diversity. Ah, okay. All oh, right. I can just see we've got a response to your uh, question about the Productivity Institute uh, earlier on. It says uh, that you should have a chat with Andy Haldane at the Royal Society of Arts and Manufacturers, and he'll be able to, to link you in. <laughs> so thank you very much uh, for that for that suggestion. Uh, right. With regards to cash, um, Several of the organisations I've worked uh, for in the past have had policies um, that they uh, want to pay uh, SMEs within two weeks of receiving an invoice. But very often, this doesn't happen. What can be done to actually enhance uh, the, the fair payment of SMEs within good time by, by large organisations is, is you know, is, is law needed to actually enforce this? I think it's diabolical, the way in which some companies treat SMEs, some major companies. Uh, I won't say which organisation I was with, but when I was with a big blue chip company, we were told on the 1st of October not to pay any suppliers until the 1st of January. So the cash at the year end looked better. Uh, the government has said time and time again that this is unacceptable. And there is uh, legislation in place that it should happen. It's not being enforced. It's just not being enforced. Uh, and I think that, uh, that, yes, something government level should be done about that because the cash is the lifeblood of, of SMEs. And I always, we always say to the SMEs, have two sets of accounts. We don't mean so you don't pay tax. We mean you take money out of the business when it's there, but you should have a set that pays you the money you should be paid for doing the job you're doing because that's the reality of how well your business is doing you know lots of people don't draw wages for two or three months of the year because they're waiting for somebody to pay them and i think that's diabolical 
I think that is an excellent point uh, to leave it. I'm afraid that time has caught up with, with us, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I know that uh, I haven't managed to get round to all of the questions that, that were asked. Um, please do uh, contact, contact us directly and we'll pass your your messages on to, to Glenn and you can begin a correspondence with him. We're also going to be posting a recording of this presentation online within the next couple of days so you can revisit uh, the, the content of, of, of today's uh, lecture. Just remains for me to thank the Worshipful Company of Marketers for their contribution to the Lord Mayor's lecture series. I'd also urge you to keep an eye on our forthcoming events page for more webinars. Uh, and in the next few days, uh, we have got a tale of two carbon markets on the 5th of February, chemistry for a sustainable world on the 6th of February, and what's happening to religion in England on the 8th of February. So something for everyone there. You can catch up with all our previous webinars on YouTube and on LinkedIn. Uh, we do hope that we're going to see you again. Thank you very much for attending and goodbye.